Joe's two favorite bass players were Matt from Rancid and, and, and Fat Mike. And I'm like, why, why would you send a record to a guy who's never heard of us? And he's probably not going to like it. And whether he writes you back or not, you're going to have your little heart broken. I don't know that this is a good idea. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. 88 Fingers Louie is an American band from Chicago, Illinois, United States, which was formed in 1993. They played a style of hardcore punk, melodic hardcore, and punk rock. After disbanding in 99, guitarist Dan and bassist Joe formed the well-known punk rock band Rise Against. The band reunited in 2009 and has continued playing shows in Chicago, Canada, Belgium, Las Vegas, and Asbury Park. The band held a 20th anniversary show in 2013, and they just played the Hopeless Records 25th anniversary show back in, like, December-ish? and uh, in California. So that was probably a good time if you were there. This is pretty cool. The name comes from a Flintstones gangster who sells dodgy pianos. I actually didn't even ask Dennis this in the interview. I just read this on Wikipedia as I'm reading this right now. So that's that's fun. Thank you, Wikipedia, for this write-up, and uh, thank you for letting me steal it. Fun fact, Dennis is a huge fan of the podcast. And by huge fan, I mean he listened to a few episodes and liked them and messaged me and said, hey, man, I like that you got some cool shit going on. So I'm going to take that as he probably has a giant tattoo of the logo on his chest now. I replied and said, dude, you need to fucking be on this podcast. And he's like, all right, that will be cool. And uh, so we got on the phone or Skype, and uh, this is what we talked about. The ballet, where the video for I've Won has gone, how he found this podcast, the Rod Stewart curse, the Josh Humble fireside story, Michael Gone or Michael Goggin, I think it's Gone. Um, <laughs> that's it's a funny one. How they shot I've won. Later, eighty-eight songs making their way onto the first Rise Against album, and a ton more. This week's episode is brought to you by Neshemni Creek Brewing Company, bringing the punk rock ruckus to liquid form. Brewing up lip smacking, palate cracking IPAs and sours. I really want one now from from just reading that. Robust dark beers and a healthy mix of classic easy drinkers. Neshemni Creek beers are available in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. Neshemni Creek will be celebrating their 7th anniversary on Saturday, June 8th with a free show, yes it's free, at their main brewing facility and tap room in Croydon, PA. Or Croydon. C-R-O-Y-D-O-N, PA. So you should go there. It's featuring Dave House from The Loved Ones, Modern Life is War, School Drugs, and fire in the radio check them out at neshemnycreekbrewing.com it's n-e-s-h-a-m-i-n-y-c-r-e-e-k-b-r-e-w-i-n-g or you can just click the link in the show notes thank you to them and thank you adam overdrives for uh hooking that up you are the man check out the new merch on this was a scene.com there's a new uh jersey logo shirt that's on fire well the shirt's not on fire the the logo's on fire it's it's uh, it's cool i designed it so you should buy it there's also other designs and shit. All right, great. Thank you again for all the people who have donated to the podcast and who are Patreons. You are my favorite people in the entire existence of the planet. Uh, if you'd like to donate yourself, you can just go to thiswasthescene.com. In the top, there's two buttons that say, I think, like, pay a buck a month and donate. So that helps keep this alive because the hosting fee has gone up for this thing since the interviews have gotten longer. And uh, I really need to pay the payment on my Porsche. <laughs> I'm kidding. Also, I'm going to start a email list to send out a weekly or bi-weekly email that's got a youtube video that i find online of an old show it'd be like you know click here to watch 88 fingers in new jersey in like 97 and the next link would say something like you know here's a spotify link of a sound song you probably haven't heard in a while and another one might be like here's some new stuff i'm listening to Super easy, just quick hits your inbox and lets you not have to search the interweb because that's what I just do on a daily basis because I'm bored and, and uh, I just like this whole shit. Anyway, great. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. This is going to sound really fancy, but uh, sure. my girlfriend and I and some of her family are going to the ballet tonight, and I forgot that... Uh, that that starts at like seven. I'm like, oh, I've got a four thirty interview. Let me see if I can move that up a little bit. <laughs>
This is the best way to start a punk rock interview. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> We're old. Going to the ballet. <laughs> Going to my favorite thing ever. Right? Right? Who cares about records? It's all about the pirouettes. It's punk rock to just love what you love, you know? It's uh, Right, right. It's just <laughs> it's um, Actually, really funny. So I usually do some research and just go back and listen to, like... Um, just old songs and watch videos and mm-hmm. things like that. It's like my favorite thing because it just it, it it puts me in a moment where I have to go and listen or and listen to old songs I haven't heard in a while or albums. And then it's but my favorite thing is just finding videos. Yeah. And you guys have so many fucking videos, but the one thing that no- makes me mad is that I've one is is gone uh, off YouTube. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a story behind that that I would love to get into, but I don't quite know have a grasp on why so oh. well <laughs> I'll i just did say that <laughs> okay, i'll just ahead. i'll tell you there's another reason why you can't uh get youtube song like studio song clips of anybody any of the stuff uh, that we did on hopeless really those aren't available either nope well i did see that on uh when i because i i was like okay I, I put it in for the search and went to look for it and yes then i was like okay let me be, get tricky on this so i went to find cinema beer goggle uh, cinema beer yeah. goggles and yeah. someone had a playlist, and I was like, "Oh fuck yeah, there it is!" And I went yep. to it, and it was like, "This was taken off by Hopeless." I'm like, "Yep, okay yep. then," because it, it 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 was something about it, like international rights or something, or kind it's of, all about it's it's all about how the label gets paid or doesn't get paid. Yeah, and they I get it. They haven't worked out their agreement with YouTube yet. I'll tell you how I found out uh, that Hopeless was doing that was, uh, God, well. Like everything else on Hopeless, it's been at least 20, 25 years. Uh, we did a Christmas, we did a Chicago band Christmas um, uh, compilation um, that we were part of, I should say, that we didn't do, but we were part of like 93 or 94. And we just, this really cheesy, shitty, thrashy version of All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth. And a couple of years ago, I just was, you know, you, you, you're on Facebook and you're in that festive mood around the holidays. So I was going to put that song up. All of a sudden I said, like, wait, why is this? why is this blocked? And then, uh, I was just like picking up other random 88 stuff and I couldn't find it. And I was like, what the fuck? Did we piss them off that bad? So, you know, of course I immediately thought it was, it was 88 only. And I was like, Oh, wait, God, let me, let me look for some Sam I am or some Bill. <laughs> Same thing. I'm like, God damn it. So we were at, we were at Hopeless's office, um, back in January. Uh, yeah. Cause you guys, did you guys play the, the reunion the like 25 years? We did the, re- the 25 anniversary. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, Hopeless just, Hopeless actually just put out, um, uh, we, on vinyl, we reissued the first two albums. Uh, we remixed and remastered the first two albums on Hopeless. Um, so we put, we had, vi- we got vinyl versions of those. And I know at one point we asked the, the YouTube question and I think we was, we were told they're in discussions, but, it, but as of right now, things are going to stay the way, the way they are. Hmm, interesting. Well, yeah, I guess it makes sense because Hopeless what is if- quite gigantic and I guess, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, their labels are like, these are the ways we make money, so we got to figure this out, YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Funny story, before we jump into this, um, yeah. a buddy of mine, he actually, sure. he was working on this, he was working for this startup uh, for the last couple of years, and they started off making, it was like, th- th- something like the 3D space and how to, if you, let's say you were the, the Yankees, and then all of a sudden somebody's 3D yeah. rendering out um, like Jeter dolls or something. They were creating mm-hmm. a software or some way to spot that, and if you were that person doing that, it would kind of funnel you in between you making that shit and the Yankees in the middle. Say, okay, you're allowed to sell this, but that percentage of this money is going to go to here and here. And they Holy got, cow. yeah, they ended up getting bought out by Facebook, oh. and because it ended up turning into it's it listens to uh, music on Facebook and Instagram. And if it hears it, it will like stop the video and like, or it'll find a way to monetize or something like that. So that's, and I think that's the person who did that. I think he invented the shit that's doing that on YouTube. Oh, wow. So that's how they're finding it is for that guy. That's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. So he so, had money. So, so he's a multimillionaire narc. Is what... <laughs> yeah. Well, the guy who started the company well, just says, yeah, it was like, <laughs> I, I put up a video. Um, I'll jump into the interview in a second, but I jump. I put up yeah. a video on, on Instagram on a, in my, and I, it was, had this band in the background, this band called balance and composure. Yeah. And, I know. Oh, I fucking love that band. And I, yeah. I, I shared it to Facebook 
And all of a sudden the song was ripped out and it said, you're violating rights or something. I said, this was just in the background of my apartment when yeah. it was playing. And I, so I text my buddy, I go, is this your fucking doing? He's like, I can say nothing. <laughs> I can confirm nor deny this is going on. <laughs> it's like, dick. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. like you said, people need to get paid. Yeah, it's, it's true. As goofy man. as it is. Yeah. I mean, but uh, cool, man. So um, I know you have to get to the ballet, so I don't want to... <laughs> I want to keep you. <laughs> um, how did you, uh, real quick, uh, how did you find this again? Just that someone, because you had hit me up and said you, you dug it, and I was like, yeah. holy shit. Uh, actually, Popeye uh, oh, okay. sh- shared shared the uh, shared the link to the podcast, and uh, I don't know Popeye really well. I've, I've, I've uh, hung out with him a couple times, and I'm a huge, huge Farsight fan, and, and, and actually a fan of that uh, the last band he did, the uh, Your Favorite Train Wreck. And uh, I've always wanted to keep in touch with uh, what he's doing and was hoping he'd start getting back into music. And I'm like, oh, this is the closest <laughs> I might get to, uh, to, to to getting an update on his music. Uh-huh. And uh, I just went back. I'm I'm a bit of a podcast uh, aficionado. So I went back and, and took a look at a couple of the older ones you did. And I got the, the Eric Victor one and uh, Jason Black one. I was like, oh, shit, this is really good. So <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah, <laughs> that's really cool. Actually, funny Popeye. After the interview, I asked him about. He had a couple songs, and he sent me um, a link to an entire album that he did that never got um, like released. That son of a bitch. Yeah, so I'll have to talk to you after this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, <laughs> please. please. <laughs> um, cool, man. So uh, no, but I appreciate you taking the time. And um, yeah, anyone listening, I am pretty sure you fucking know who Eighty Eight Fingers Louie is because this entire demographic who's listening to this podcast um knows that name definitely um i remember the way i found out about you guys initially was i was at my buddy's house because all my friends were in a punk rock way before i was i was listening to like tool and all this like metal and shit <laughs> yeah. and i um so they went out and just bought everything that was you know the, I, I don't know what the the funnel was as my buddy chris he was in one of these interviews and Mm-hmm. whatever punk rock album started hit him off. I think it was probably like, like you know, Face to Face and Bad Religion and all those. And all, all those thank you lists are where we all found all the bands. Oh, and yeah. so he just bought stacks and stacks of CDs based on that. And I remember walking into his room and I saw, I think it was like the cover for Behind Bars. And mm-hmm. it was just like, it just stood out to me because it's just like this comic character that's just this dude with these two like half naked chicks in this <laughs> slummy room. <laughs> And uh, I'm yeah. like, oh, I think I'm gonna like this whole punk rock thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's so that's so how cool. uh, that's how like you know, and this was like '90, man, '96 or something. So yeah. But anyway, so I gotta go off in tangents. What I like to do is really go back in time to when you were very little and kind sure. of see how you got into music and take us to, um, like right over like t- into early 2000 uh, which is definitely okay. relevant because you guys had gotten back together back then and did a, another yeah. album but um but yeah so um what as a, at a young age got you into loving just music in general oh wow uh well uh grew up in uh i won't say a musical household but uh dad always had you know either you know um rock radio on or he had you know cassettes of various bands from the 70s and you know we had eight track player full of the full of the hits. Um, but I, I would say probably the first band that really, uh, kind of caught my ear, my brother's ear too. We were just a couple of years apart. Um, was, was the Beatles. My dad had the white album and we listened to that constantly. And that was, you know, every time we would walk into the, uh, uh, the family eating room, there was always some sort of Beatles seem, seemingly always some sort of Beatles song playing. So that kind of was ingrained in our, in our heads. And then, as we got a little bit older, we started kind of paying attention to song lyrics and, you know, what Beatles saying what, and, um, you know, eventually we started getting allowances and we were going out and getting our own cassettes or going to garage sales and finding shit for, for cheap. And that was, you know, that was God, early grade school, you know, maybe six, seven, eight. And okay. then, and then a couple of years later, um, <laughs> kind of a funny story uh, a couple of years later our best friends down the street their next door neighbor did some some uh, cleaning and he dumped all of his kiss records because 
Kiss's dynasty had come out a couple years ago, and he's like, Kiss went disco, fuck them. <laughs> and he, and this guy threw out all of his Kiss records. I'm talking, wow. and he was a Kiss Army dude, so he had like the belt buckles and the tour programs and all that shit. So we went, you know, we went dumpster diving. And wow. Between between uh, our, our our neighbors and uh, my two brothers and I, we, you know, we just amassed this in, entire. Uh, collection just just out of the garbage so kiss became the new obsession a couple years later um and then really i think i think really those two bands uh for me uh i kind of figured out that i was not going to be the guy that collected sports cards i was going to be the guy that was going to you know get magazines and cut out pictures of my favorite bands and put them on the wall paste them on your wall yeah 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 exactly actually it's funny my neighbor he uh he was like my sister's age, he was like five years older than me. So I was like, uh-huh. you know, the, all the older kids, we'd look up to them, even though they'd like beat the hell out of us or just picked on us. <laughs> yeah. But he was a huge Kiss fan. And I remember, um, I remember just, I forgot about it. Like I loved Kiss so much just because he loved it. But Gene Simmons, like just looking at him at a young age, I was like, this guy's so scary. I'm so into Dude, it. yes. It was so there fucking was a, awesome. There was a poster. I can picture it now. Uh, we were at like a, you know, campground where they had like, you know, carnival rise and shit like that and you could i don't know what game we played but you could buy you could, you could either buy or win stuff and one of the things that i remember getting was this i don't know if it was kiss alive or it was just just a live picture of kiss and it was the 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 biggest picture of this poster i remember it was gene simmons and he more blood on his face than than yes you know i can i can remember and it not only did it scare the shit out of me my mom was. My mom started hearing rumors that Kiss was. Uh, I think. I think she had heard a rumor that Kiss stood for Knights in Satan's Service. Yes. I, so, yep. Yep. I think she might have thought that they were <laughs> satanic. But uh, to be a hundred percent honest with you, as much as I love Kiss, I would get nightmares if I fell asleep with my face toward the poster. So I had to train <laughs> myself to to turn the other way so I wouldn't get fucking freaked out. Oh, I get it. I mean, I remember. Um... I'm not gonna say on Kiss, but there was, I think I know what you're talking about too, because that's like in in the seventies, if you look at any video or photos from back then, there's just something about what bands being yeah. on stage with the smoke and the lights that makes it look yes. creepy. Even it's like, if you watch an old horror movie, it's something about it. Cause it's so old and grainy that you're like, this is so fucking creepy. Yes. And, um, Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. I remember like hearing that Gene Simmons, some like they would say he would have like cow's blood and that's what he would spit mm-hmm. out, even though it was probably yep. corn syrup that was just dyed or some <laughs> shit. And the reason why his the reason why his tongue was so long is because he got it surgically altered from a yeah from a cow's tongue or yes. some shit yeah yeah Jesus Christ <laughs> I remember I, ble- I believed all this shit until right now <laughs> yeah oh then uh, how about this and I, 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 we we don't have to stay at Kiss obviously but, we're gonna uh, talk about Kiss for an hour fuck everyone else but, listening <laughs> yeah right right fuck this punk rock shit uh, the we we got our uh, I think part of the um, part of the booty we collected of the kiss stuff was, was uh, at least a couple of the kiss solo albums. And I think I was able to, to call the Gene Simmons solo album. Like, fuck. Yeah. I got the scariest dude kiss. I'm going to bring this record home and it's going to scare the shit out of me. And it was the fucking wimpiest sounding solo record out of the four of them. Yeah. He's singing when you wish upon a star and <laughs> doing shit with Diana Ross or whatever. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I've made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately regret my decision. Yes, right. All that I that I I think I I think I honestly I think I went from that point I think I jumped from Peter from uh from uh, Gene Simmons to Peter Chris cuz his voice sounded like Rod Stewart. Oh. Okay. Actually my friend <laughs> my, my my friends me and my friends have this thing where Rod Stewart is like totally um every time he's on the radio we'd have to run out cuz something bad would always happen when Rod Stewart came. Oh, out. No. And something always did. Actually and the funniest thing oh, no. is that it always happened like that. Like, and we're going to jump back into how you got a punk rock but um <laughs> uh, I was I was married uh before and at, at my wedding yeah. So before my wedding, my, my wife at the time, or fiance at the time, she goes, so my dad chose a Rod Stewart song for the wedding. And I was like, fuck. So I had to tell all my guys or groomsmen. I'm like, guys, I'm just going to let you know that Rod's going to come on <clears throat> and you're all Hold allowed on. to leave. You're all allowed to leave. <laughs> oh. So they all left. And then like I stayed there and watched her dance with her dad. And then two and a half years later, we were divorced. <laughs> oh, my God. So I was like, holy fuck, it's true. <laughs> so I God. stay away from Rod Stewart. Oh, that's insane. Well. Yeah. 
So. One last Rod Stewart thing. Yeah. And I promise no more Rod Stewart the entire conversation. Uh, we uh, uh, a, a new bar opened up down the street from us, um, for my girlfriend and I, and we uh, we went with some friends of ours. This is two weeks ago, maybe three. And uh, I, I, I karaoke every once in a while when the nice. when the mood calls for it. It, nice. it had been a it had been a number of years since I've done it, and uh, I decided um, that my song, one of my songs uh, that night was um, "Do You Think I'm Sexy?" And I thought I'm going to pull this off and. It's gonna be funny and people are gonna laugh and that song is hard as fuck to sing, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, I I knew thirty seconds in I had, I clearly had made a, a, a bad decision. It was <laughs> it was fucking terrible. That happens in karaoke. You start singing like this is gonna be funny, and then as soon as you start, you're like, Oh god, this is gonna be really bad. Yeah. I gotta stop. Yeah. Um actually that kinda I that brought up a question. That's a good this is a great segue that I didn't plan. Um I was listening huh. to a lot of the older stuff and then and the now the newer stuff, because you have the newer uh album out from two thousand seventeen. Yeah. And your voice is like sustained, like you know, it's a it's slightly rough in the first album, but it, like your style is still there, and it's it's like this very strong vocal uh, voice oh, that you have, and you. I feel like it's literally it sounds like if I could hear um I can hear a song from like '95 or like '96 and now and, and think that you guys like you recorded around the same time. Oh wow, that's awesome. That's that's everything. That that was one of the you know uh, concerns I think we had going into making the record like we don't want it to sound exactly like the old stuff but hopefully Maybe your voice it sounds enough but old, yeah. a lot of a lot of bands now are recording new albums and their voices have completely changed and you're like what the fuck but like yours is sustained um yeah. so like before like right around the time you know the beatles and kiss and you know rod stewart um what like <laughs> what, what like transitioned you into punk rock and at that time were you also a singer like were you taking vocals or were you in choir or anything like that um well, we during during grade school, uh, I think I think one through I went to a, a Catholic grade school, and I think it was uh, first through eighth grade. I don't think there was a yeah, no, there wasn't a separate junior high. It was first through eighth grade, and I think music like singing and in, in you know with other classmates, I think that started pretty early on, if not first grade, then you know second or third grade. And so I've been singing in some sort of you know classroom setting um, for you know, five, six years, seven years. And then, um, uh, right around the time I graduated grade school, um, my brother and I convinced our parents to, uh, buy us skateboards. And so we got along with our first, uh, skate decks, we got our first copies of Thrasher magazine and my brother and I immediately just started combing through, um, you know, looking for certain skaters and looking at the ads for music and, stuff like that so um i'd say ground zero would probably be around age 14 okay. when i when i picked up my first thrasher i i i i'm sure I'm, i had seen other music magazines out there you know kiss 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 monthly or whatever <laughs> but uh uh thrasher yeah and, and, and my punk rock to me was you know at that point i think i heard like the dead milkman and in in maybe like a violent femme song but i hadn't really like heard any like punk 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 rock or whatever um so yeah, at, at at fourteen um is when we got the bug or I got the bug I should say and uh um yeah I wasn't singing I mean eighty eight was the first band I ever sang for and okay. I um so did there you was have no... like but did you have like during you know in grade school into high yeah. school like did you have because I remember I remember when I because I I sang in I sang like it was like two singers in my old band like. Back mm -hmm. then, and I remember being in high school or in middle school, I was in a play and I loved it. And I always wanted to just do plays, and that led me to like taking going to choir and things like that because I'm like, man, I like performing, I love singing. I don't know how the fuck I'm gonna do this, and I ended up just, trip, just tripping over and become you know getting in a band, which took care of both. Did you have the same thing happen oh, where wow. you just loved like you know singing or anything? You didn't even think about it until '88. You know, I depending on the song we were doing in class, and it's funny that the the teacher that we had, um, she was, you know, clearly somebody that grew up in the in the '60s and '70s because a lot of the stuff we were singing was, you know, Simon and Garfunkel and the Mamas and the Papas. Yeah. Um, all all well and good, but uh, whether whether we got her to do this or or she did it on her own, 
we started doing Beatles songs. And one of the first songs I remember doing was uh, Yellow Submarine. And I think it was a case of just me maybe singing a little bit louder than everybody else just because I was so into the Beatles <laughs> that, that uh, you know, she picked up on that. And every once in a while we'd be singing and she'd just call out for me to sing a part of the song by myself. And But I, I was, a, you know, it, that, that was, you know, 12, 13 years old. And right. I was, you know, probably pissed in my pants singing in in front of everybody by myself um so yeah i really i mean i don't think i really had a desire to sing um i just had fun singing it I think i had fun singing but i never thought i'd, I'd be a guy in a band no i can kind of see where she would have called you out because you have a very loud voice <laughs> yes yes <laughs> so i i, I remember yeah so people who had loud voices i mean <clears throat> granted you know no one would ask you to sit in front of a, a, a an audience with that and you couldn't hold a fucking tune but um, right, right. You know, especially if you have a strong voice you, and I bet like you it's just loud in general I bet you don't have to really try to project it just is very fucking loud yeah to a definitely to a fault like hey man can you can you, can you donut down we're you know we're in the library or yeah <laughs> like sorry <laughs> your voice of modulation I really love this fucking book you guys <laughs> So like when you got into, uh, so this, you know, going into high school, um, you know, being a, a choir star, <laughs> like <laughs> what got you into, um, like going to like punk shows? Like what was, uh, what was that first of all, like being in a band and, and playing in a show or was it just like going to show? Cause your buddy was like, we got to go fucking check this out. Oh, we, oh, I was definitely going to shows before I, um, before I joined the band, but they were not, they weren't like super DIY shows. I mean, I, I, the, the very first show I went to, uh, I shouldn't say the very first show I went to without my parents, but the f- first punk show I, I guess I went to without my parents was, uh, uh, I actually saw the Dead Milkman, and that was awesome. And then like the year later, or maybe even the same year, uh, that the same guy I went to Dead Milkman with, we went and saw the Bad Brains in Leeway. Oh, wow. And that was like, that was, you know, 80, you know, 89, so I'm, I'm, I'm so 16 at the time 16 going on 17 seeing seeing this and i just remember thinking like oh oh my 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 life as i've as i've known it before is is over (laughs) uh and uh so from from yeah like dead milkman and bad brains then i would i'd go to like the bigger shows like you know uh out here and uh naked reagan obviously being a hometown band they they were always playing really big shows here so we'd, we'd go to see them whenever we could and um, but it wasn't, honestly, it probably wasn't until about the year before I joined 88 that I was going to, um, you know, more for lack of a better word, uh, smaller scale punk shows on any sort of regular basis. So, um, so I kind of made that jump from like 89 to 90 to like another two years before I really started, um, going to shows on a regular basis. And that's, that's how I met the guys. And, um, you know, my best friends to this day and the, and the guys in 88 was just going to shows and yelling out the song lyrics back and, you know, the usual stuff. So this is, this is all in Chicago, obviously. Chicago in the Chicago area. Yeah. You know, so the, half the, hour one way or the other. Yeah. It's such a gigantic suburb. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, so the Metro, is that around back then? Yeah, it was called the Cabaret Metro. That's actually where I saw Dead Milkman. Okay, and then yeah. the Fireside wasn't around yet, right? It was still a bowling alley? Right. Fireside back then was just a strictly legitimate bowling alley. It didn't start doing shows um, until late 94, early 95. And I want to say early 95 is probably closer. So we've I've talked about the fireside a bunch of times because there's always these venues around the country that were the the like the mecca where you had to go play and yeah we had heard of the fireside and it, actually it, I can swear to I I know it's 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 do you were in this story um, mm. my buddy Josh and this band called Humble Beginnings uh, <laughs> we play with Humble Beginnings. Okay, so then, all right, this is that's the fucking story. The one, the one is time, the one and only time uh, we ever played. West Orange, New Jersey, or Orange, New Jersey. We played with Humble Beginnings, and wasn't wasn't Gabe in that band too? Um, Gabe was in the band, and then he yeah. went and formed Midtown. Wait, was was that show? Okay, I'm gonna kind of balance this out. <laughs> that show in West Orange, yeah. Did was that um when you guys came out with the fuck your ninety the record in '99? Um, uh, back on the streets. Back on the streets, yes. Yeah, 
yeah, uh, we tore down that one. I think we played with you too, which you probably not remember. I, I was in a band What's called Lane, Lane Meyer, and yes. Oh, okay. Yes, you wow. definitely played that show. Yeah, that you guys, you guys, it was like this small venue, and the, the stage was like way in the back, kind of in a sunken yes. floor or something like that. Yeah, and we stayed at Gabe's at Gabe's parents' house that night. Oh my god, that's I didn't know. I can't, God, I couldn't put the fucking put, put the pieces together when that was. But okay, before that though, that's awesome. You remember that too? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but Josh, he um, he told me the story. They went on tour, and we were just about to, like we were kind of revving up because we wanted to go on tour. So Hummel goes on their first tour, big tour. Yeah. And they're out in Chicago, and he and he tells me the story. He's like, "Yeah, we we play at the Fireside." And I'm like, "What is this place?" He's like, "Oh my God, it's the best place." He's like, "Tell me about it." And he goes, "So I'm sitting there having a conversation with Dennis from '88, <laughs> and and all of a sudden he goes to me, "Hey, hold on, man, I actually got to get up and play." And 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 you guys got up and played a show in like '97. So I think you guys had already broken up, and we're gonna go back to that like you know, before this. But you guys had just broken up, yeah. and you guys got back together to play like a show at the Fireside, or just played a couple songs or something like that. Do you remember this at all? Yes, if I remember correctly. Um, so so this would have been like the early part of '98. Yes. Um, we had just finished practice. We. I don't know that we had announced that we were back together. We'd certainly let a couple of promoters in the, in the area know that we were back together. And I think we were booked to do something maybe closer to the spring or summer, but you know, and we had already started, you know, kind of rehearsing and in, uh, for that. And we were just wrapped up a practice in, <laughs> this is in the pager days. And one of us got a page <laughs> from, uh, from Brian or Dave, who were the two guys that booked at the fireside. And they said, Hey, we got a, a headlining band running late tonight. Any chance you guys are going to, you guys can come down and play a couple songs as a surprise. And uh, we're like, yeah, sure. What's the name of the band? And it was Link 80. Oh, wow. So it kind of worked out because we went up there and said, we're Link 88. <laughs> and we just went into like, you know, <laughs> three songs or whatever. But if, if but I think that's the show because I remember kind of getting there, you know, I think we, I think we, I don't think we all went in at the same time. I think we all kind of like, you know, some of us would hang out for a couple of minutes and then then come in, you know, later than than the others. And I think, yeah, I think I went, you know, knowing me, I probably went right into the bar and I probably saw Josh there. And yeah, he like just said he was having a conversation. This is this is yeah. literally like I'm not even kidding. This that conversation and them coming out from tour and him telling me this. I mean, I was already stoked to go on tour, but I was like, yeah. we have to go to the fireside based on that <laughs> fucking story. Not like yeah, I was yeah. gonna just run into you there and like and play the show with you, but I was like, it was just th- him telling me about it and how excited he was. I'm like, I need to be on the road now. Like, this oh, sounds that's awesome. amazing. Yeah, so yeah. I was so excited to like tell you that story. <laughs> we got that's it. That's so awesome. Um, okay, so like going back though, you know, yeah. you started to go to shows. Um, you know, like how did you get involved with the guys and like how did you like were they a band first and you joined or did you guys all kind of come together and start the band? They they had so Joe and Dan, uh, original bass player Joe and Dan are, are original and current guitar player. They had been playing with pretty much our our, our first drummer Dom. Um, maybe he was in and out for uh, a few months, but they had played with a couple different singers under a couple different bands. I I don't believe they played any shows at that point. I think it was just pretty much like basement basement stuff and and i don't yeah i don't think they played out i think they were just you know screwing around here and there and then um yeah through going to shows and a buddy of mine i was i was going to college with i met up with uh the guys in the band the bull weevils who who were um huge influences on us you know uh and so we'd started to go to see whenever whenever bull weevils were playing whether it was you know and i'm gonna throw out random chicago suburbs uh whether it was like elmhurst illinois or crystal lake illinois or you know barrington illinois or wherever we would you know it didn't matter if they were five minutes away or 55 minutes away we were we were going to hang out with our friends and sing along and then it was like new year's eve 92 going into 93 um i'd gone record shopping with joe a couple times and you know and knew that we were both in the same kind of music but he had uh I didn't, I didn't realize that they were looking for anybody, um, anybody that joined their band. And he said, Hey, I want to get, uh, was my, my, my college buddy that introduced me to everybody. Um, Hey, your buddy, Eric's going to try out. I think, uh, I think we practice not that far from where you're living. And at that point I was, um, 
probably 10 minutes away from where they practice. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll come out and, and, uh, uh, you know, I'll come out and support Eric. It'll be, that'll be fun. We'll, you know, we'll go to Denny's afterwards and <laughs> stay up, stay up till 2 AM with, uh, with drinking Coca-Cola. It'll be awesome. Nice. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I met, uh, Eric there and a couple of the Bogles guys actually went too um, for support and, you know, just to hang out or whatever. And, uh, Eric went up, did a couple covers and, uh, you could tell he wasn't comfortable. It was just, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a positive experience. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And he was really bummed out and I could, you know, totally understandable. And we're like, all right, well, uh, let's, let's go. I got a, I got a Dr. Pepper calling my name. Let's, let's, uh, let's go hit the diner. We got to get to Denny's and, guys. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> priorities. Priorities. And one of the Bogles guys said, hey, hang on, hang on. You guys should give Dennis a shot. And I'm like, I started laughing because, again, I had no – I was I – was, uh, to uh, take a step back, I was um, – I had planned on being a fireman. That was, that was my goal. Okay. I had no, no musical desire in my, in, my, in my head at all. I wanted to be a fireman. So even at that point, when they like, hey, give, let, the, you know, let Dennis try it, I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? I don't want to sing in a band. And – they're like, oh, come on! When we sing in the car, you, you know, you're all, you're always really good during the Dag Nasty songs, or you're always, you know, whatever. I'm like, all right, whatever. Let's fucking let's fucking go. So I I I did probably a Peg Boy song and a Screeching Weasel song or something, and uh, uh, they're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, we're gonna talk about it. and We'll let you know. And like, okay, all right. Twenty twenty four forty eight hours later, they said, do you want to join the band? And again, I'm thinking, wow. yeah, all right, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll play in the basement and hang out and, you know, talk shit and Jesus get to do Christ. it in front of a microphone. It'll be, it'll be awesome. But I had no, I didn't think we were going to play a show. I certainly didn't think we were going to even make t-shirts. You know what I mean? Like I was just like, all right, we're just going to, we're going to write scrappy punk rock songs and, and, and play to five people, you know? And, uh, um, and then things kind of picked up you know, within, within the, the, the next few months after that. So this is, this is, we got together and called our, and called, came up with the name 88 Fingers Louie, like April of 93. Okay. And I want to say around June or July was when we, um, we recorded four songs uh, at a local studio. And then July, later part of July of that year, we played our first show. And I remember, I remember it being in one of the, crappiest parts of chicago and it also happened to be on the same night that the bulls had won like their third championship oh jesus so the, the especially that part of the city was just a fucking it was it was it was a melee it was it was every every man for themselves and uh <laughs> we we played the back of a buddy's laundromat it was it was pretty pretty cool but we we got to play with los crudos okay this is like the jordan bulls days right yeah yeah okay yeah so yeah. Fat jesus christ but yeah. it, so I'm like reading Wikipedia right now too, and it says 93 because it's you know you're saying April 93, and you guys also put yeah. out three seven inches that year. That is incorrect. Okay, but, I was gonna uh, say I was like, hot damn. <laughs> you know, the only thing we put out on our own um, was in 93, and that was the the, the record we we, we uh, recorded and put out ourselves. I take that back. We might have had the first fat seven inch out by the end of ninety three. Well, it says but happy anniversary, happy anniversary seven inch, go away and wanted. I don't think wanted came out until ninety four. Okay, maybe yeah, I'm maybe Wikipedia, I'm wrong. Yeah, Wikipedia. I mean, the Wikipedia is like you know written down oh, by just like fans and shit usually. Oh, there's a Wikipedia entry on there that you may have you may have seen that uh, we're 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 keeping the legend alive. I'll just put it I'll put it that way. Yeah, there's, like there's that. I, I can edit it myself right now if I want to. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. When somebody told me, somebody told me there's a there, there's a description of a uh, one of the breakups on there. Um, the fight. They're like, like that or... yeah. They're like, is it true that blank happened? And I'm like, uh, yeah. If it's on Wikipedia, and I could go back. I can. I know I can go on there and change it, but I think it's so fucking ridiculous <laughs> that I'm. Why not keep it up? And if that if that just means people are going to continue to ask questions about it, then then let them. I actually was going to later, so but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, ooh, about... juicy questions. Let's keep yeah. this interesting. No, 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 no. Nah. Um, all right. So, but okay. So you guys, you guys. So you just like trip over 
a band, you're, they're like, you should join us. And then you start fucking yeah. singing because you have a very, you know, as we just established that you have a very loud voice as the choir teacher <laughs> found yeah. out early. So you got you start playing shows and, you know, the, like how quickly uh, did it start to pick up where you guys started, where you were like, shit, this is, this is fucking something I want to do. Oh, I, I, I think we probably just had a couple of shows under our belt when I realized like, oh, um, you know, I, 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 you speak to most singers, if not every singer, they're going to tell you they, they like the attention. Okay. And I realized, I realized, oh, oh man, I'm, I'm not just, a, I'm not just the face of the crowd anymore. People are actually <laughs> like, they're not just looking at me. They're, <laughs> they're not looking at me and looking away. They're looking at me and they're holding their they're holding that look for, you know, the better part of 20, you know, 25 minutes, whatever our set lengths were at that time. And I just think, started thinking like, okay, again, not thinking I was going to be doing any, any sort of, tour. I don't even think touring entered our head, or at least it didn't enter my head that first year. Um, but I knew a few shows in, I was like, oh, this is, this is a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be. Um, but again, in the back of my head, I'm like, this will be fun. And then I'm going to have to say, off to be a fireman guys can't can't do this how old are you getting at uh, this time were you like 18 19 19? uh 20 i'm sorry 20 uh just a few months shy of my 21st birthday that's so wild like what was the scene like because i i got into it in jersey around mm-hmm. 96 so i i talk about okay. all the time where this is where it's starting to like blow up and not on an mtv level we're about like just before that where blank came out with dude ranch and you yeah, know, the, all that shit started happening in, in um, I think like linoleum, like no effects came out, like no, linoleum was like a big hit, like in the underground scene, like all these things. So you, you're, yeah, this yeah. is like 93. So this is, and then like, you know, you're saying you go to a bad brain show. Like that's like when there was like the scary punk days from what I came hearing. Oh, yeah. Like you're like, yeah. fuck, I'm going to die. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, like I'm yeah, gonna, I'm going to die and I'm going to die. I'm going to die a happy motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. So like, um, that, it, yeah, come on. I was going to say, uh, at least for us, we just we had built be, be, because of our friends in the Bull Weevils. Uh, we we met so many other awesome bands, and we. It's funny we 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 talk about it now as if we had like this goofy click going, and I guess maybe in some respects it was kind of clicky, but we just the the bands that we played shows with, we hung out with when we weren't on stage, we weren't sharing our stage together. We were at Denny's, or we were record shopping, or we were listening to records at you know in someone's basement, or we were you know. Um, it was just, it was just kind of, it, 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 as cheesy as it might sound, it was just kind of a big group of dudes that all wanted to hang out with each other. Um, and I guess getting back to the clicky thing, there was a certain, there was definitely like, all right, let me, let me put this the best way I can. There was the, there was the Chicago, uh, the, for lack of a better word, the junior naked Ray guns and the junior peg boys. That's kind of where we felt like we, we, we fell in with, um, and then there was the guys that were, um, big into like screeching weasel. And I love, I love screeching weasel, but at that time, the, the people that were following them around, we weren't, uh, we weren't too keen on, or they weren't too keen. They probably weren't too keen on, they probably weren't too keen on me because I have a loud voice (laughs) and I had, I had the, uh, I had the comments to, uh, to, to go along with it. Unfortunately, it was like the giant. It's like the Jets and the Sharks from like West Side Story. You guys are just yeah, like exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> if 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 the shark had a had a fucking mouth that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't stop talking, that that, <laughs> that that would have been me. Uh, but yeah, back 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 then, you know, uh, there wasn't so so with those factions of people, there wasn't a lot of cross. Uh, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of crisscrossing. Like you didn't see a lot of screeching weasel dudes at our show. And, and, and vice versa. Um, although, you know, like I said, we, I, I, I liked them a lot. We actually played one of the Screeching Weasel album shows. Um, I can't remember for which album now that I think about it, but um, it was cool because, you know, I'd been listening to them and, 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 and admired them for so long, but I just, the crowds that they, that they ran around with, we just, we butted heads. And I don't know if it was because at that point we had already put out a record on Fat and they were like, oh, you guys are fucking... Even though they, I think now that I think about it, Screeching Weasel was already on Lookout, so it was like, yeah, why are we why are we battling on Chicago bands on California labels? Like it's, <laughs> were the it fucking happened. Were the Screeching Weasel fans kind of like the like the tight 
like the Ramon style clothing yes. guys. Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah like just I, I could totally see that. And then you guys were more of like the the baggy clothes, extra large shirts, even though you were like 120 pounds. Like, uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Jinko That's jeans. Exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I didn't go. It. I didn't go Jinko. I'm yeah. proud to say I did not go Jinko. But <laughs> everything else you just described, I 100% uh, admit to. Oh, I went full Jinko. I cut the <laughs> bottoms off to those bitches. Um, <laughs> I'm so surprised of how you guys were able to have such a scene in Chicago. Not, not. I mean, wait a minute. Jersey was so small that yeah. through all these interviews I've done, it kind of all came together why I could see why Jersey worked because it was so tiny. To, it would only take like half hour, if that, to get to shows, and it's an it's thirty minutes. It's an hour coast to coast or coast to river. And yeah. top to bottom is three hours. So within that, you know, the central and north is where everything kind of happened between like New Brunswick and up in Wayne, New Jersey and shit. And it was it wasn't yeah. a long ride. Jer- Chicago is fucking gigantic. I, I was out there a couple years ago. So I was traveling and I was in my friend's house. Mm-hmm. My friend Amber Payne. She'll be very I know happy. Amber. You know Amber? Oh, I'm shit. I know Amber. Oh, my God. Everyone knows Amber. Amber's the fucking I've known, I've known Amber for probably 20 years now Are you really yeah <laughs> that's awesome <What> up, Amber? <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna freak out she um yeah i was at her place in uh chicago or yeah in chicago obviously um she lives yeah. i don't know like right in the city somewhere. logan logan square i thought at least at least for a while that's where i would run into her it's the place logan that square. she owns now or she's owned for a couple of years um oh okay yeah i don't know but i remember at that my buddy's like yo you should come out and we should get like lunch or something yeah, yeah it's I, It took me a fucking hour, and on the I'm like, oh, this won't take that long. I'm like, this is so big, this yeah. fucking city. So, how, like, when you guys would go to shows, did you just drive fucking hours on end to go shows, or did you stay in a small area to like watch shows and play shows? Um, oh no, we drove, we drove. Well, drive, yeah, drive, playing. I mean, yeah, I guess you would drive yeah. more, but to watch but no, them. Going to shows, I would say. We every once in a while, if it was a if it was a band that we were big enough into, um, we would drive to Milwaukee. I mean, we we would take the two hour drive to Milwaukee from from Chicago. But for the most part, we from what I remember, for the most part, I think we just we kind of just stayed within the city limits. Which again, depending on what part of the city you were living in, it could take you an hour to get from the northwest side to the south side. You know, it yeah. wasn't that wasn't unheard of, especially with with traffic. But then you know, we've got a whole we've got so many you know uh suburbs uh neighboring us that uh especially especially in the 90s it was hard for uh chicago clubs didn't want to put on shows punk rock shows because of what went down in the in the 80s you know with you know fights and and you know all that sort of stuff and in in uh over aggressive bouncers so i would sp- probably until the fire definitely until the fireside and to a certain extent the metro started doing um punk rock shows again we were our, our the shows that we were primarily going to and playing were out in the suburbs but we weren't i don't know that we on a regular basis i don't know that we drove more than 45 minutes or an hour to go to him to go to yeah yeah, yeah. god that's yeah but it's just yeah it's just, um, it, it just like this, this the scene in chicago and i'm I th- i'm yeah, I'm guessing it still is. It was so strong back then. I mean, oh, totally. It was an ama- it was amazing. Like that was the place. It, that and, and any I don't remember, remember any other scenes that we'd always hear. But Chicago was the it was like a magnet for bands even who lived 14 hours away or like 22 hours away. We all heard about yeah. Chicago and how fucking amazing it was, and it was so fucking inviting. As a band. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to hear you say it because I know when we were you know being in the thick of it, like yeah, we. We were stoked when our friends' bands from out of town would come into town, and they just just to see them, their eyes light up. And not even, well, definitely, play, you know, the fact that they were playing the fireside, even though to us it was like, oh, it's a fucking bowling alley. It smells like piss all the time, <laughs> but it's a it's a great place to play shows. Uh, but just you know, friends of ours, especially you know, on the west coast, they'd come into town, and you know, these guys are these guys are waking up at six thirty a.m. every morning and going surfing, and they're looking at Lake Michigan, being like. I don't think we could surf this. I'm like, no, dude. There's not a lot, of, not a lot of surfing going on. In not a lot Michigan, of wake. But, not a lot of wake going yeah. on out there. But, but you know, taking them, taking them out to, uh, you know, getting Chicago pizza and you know, baseball games and whatever. It, 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 I never felt like at least the people that I surrounded myself with. I don't. I never felt like we excluded anybody. 
Oh no! So. I mean, we were a band that no one knew, and we were like, it was like open arms. And I, I remember even yeah. all all the shows we played. Like we played the Fireside a couple times. We played um, some place out in Mount, Mount Arlington, I think it was, or Arlington. It was Arlington a, Heights. Yeah, Arlington we played Heights. with this guy named Michael Goggin or Michael Gone. He had a keyboard and had these really songs about like wanting to fuck the Olsen twins. Do you remember? Oh, okay. sh- I don't know who that is. It was the best. <laughs> That's crazy. It was the funny. It was a song called Armpit Vagina. It was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my, my parents live in Arlington Heights, so I know that area well. That's it, Arlington Heights. Yeah, that show was mm-hmm. fucking amazing. We played with um, uh, God damn it, who was the? It was like a three-piece band that was big back then that didn't get. They had a split seven inch with Hum- with Humble Beginnings. Fuck, I don't mind. I'll, I'll have to figure it out later. Um, sorry. So, like, now, you guys, were you on Hopeless or Fat First? We were on uh, Fat First. We had uh, we had recorded the Happy Anniversary 7-inch, put that out ourselves. Um, and then we, shortly after, and I, I want to say certainly within a, within that month or two, um, I don't know if we just, if, if we borrowed money, if we had a couple bucks laying around from from playing shows but we had um saved up a few hundred dollars to go to um indiana and record at sonic iguana studios which we had liked because they had done um screeching weeds on the queer so again being fans of the music of those bands just not necessarily a fan of the people that (laughs) that those bands hung out with yeah uh we were still uh fans of the music and liked the way that sounded so we went there to record i think we recorded like six songs and um four of those six songs uh were the go the the first 88 seven inch or on, yeah first 88 seven inch um on fat go away um and what happened was we recorded those songs we mixed them probably on that same weekend and then propagandi's first record had come out or was it lag wagon no it was, i think it was i think it was propagandi's record how okay. to clean everything yeah. yeah and you know we, we fucking loved it and the joke goes, that's it, man. I'm sending our demo to Fat. I'm like, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do that? Like, this is this is the dude that, like, at 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 at, at that point, Joe's two favorite bass players were Matt from Rancid and, and and Fat Mike. And I'm like, why why would you send a record to a guy who who's never heard of us and he's probably not going to like it? And whether he writes you back or not, you could have your little heart broken. I don't know that this is a good idea, but he did it anyway. And then uh, I don't know what the time link was. Let's let's say a couple of weeks with, you know, three weeks at the most. Um, I remember getting a call at home from a very frantic Joe saying, I need to meet you as soon as possible. I'm like, uh, is everything OK? He goes, I can't talk about it on the phone. Let's get pizza. That was our that was a way to celebrate everything with us back then was let's go celebrate over pizza. So uh, we went to, you know, Pizza Hut or some dumb place and. He was shaking. I'm like, dude, what the fuck is wrong? He's like, uh, Fat Mike called me. He wants to put out a record. And wow. uh, I won't say we cried at, at the Pizza Hut, <laughs> but it was like, holy fucking shit. Are you serious right now? Wow. He's like, he's like, no, I'm 100%, 100% serious. So we, um, we started telling everybody that <laughs> that was within earshot. Oh yeah. You don't know effects. Yeah. He's got a record label and uh, we're going to put out a record on his label. Like it was, we were just bragging as much as we possibly could. <laughs> Jeez. And I know, and I know, I know that, that it, that rubs some people the wrong way because it was like, we weren't even a band a year at that point. I don't think we were eight months into our, in, into the band when we got, when we had this happen. And I don't, I, I, I got to imagine Mike's Mike or any record label, uh, guys rule is I'd like to see this band live before I decide if I'm going to work with them. He had, I don't think he had any idea what we even looked like, let alone how we would sound live, but he decided the hell of it. I, he liked the songs enough. And so we put out that, uh, the, um, that, that first, uh, fat seven inch. Um, and then, uh, shortly after that, um, was when that first fat music comp came out. Uh, uh fat music for fat people oh wow and and that that uh that single-handedly uh outside of chicago that single-handedly handedly um brought brought all the notoriety that 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 we, that we could get was just having a song on that and it was a song that was the song blink that was on our 
on the wanted seven inch. Um, that came out a couple months later. And, and in between then, we finally played a show with no effects uh, in Chicago. We got to meet them, everybody. And, you know, everybody was super cool. Um, so we did the second seven inch on fat. And then um, this gets into like late 94, early 95. We go back to Sonic Iguana and we we have enough songs that we think for an album and uh, record them. I think we maybe just did like a rough demo mix of them just to send them out to give them an idea. And Mike's like, hey, I like a couple songs, but I, I would change these songs around. And I don't know. I, I, I could speak only for myself, but I was proud enough of those songs that I thought they just they, they were fine, stand, you know, standalone songs on their own. I don't think that I didn't think they needed any sort of tweaking. So we had a kind of a discussion and, and you know, at, at that time, three out of the four of us were like, no, we, we like these songs enough. We're going to we're going to we're going to keep, you know, put our foot down. And so Mike's like, cool. Well, um, you know, no hard feelings, but uh, these songs definitely need to be heard. I just don't think that they're fat, you know, material or whatever. And he's the one who actually gave us uh, Lewis from Hopeless's phone number. Oh, that's cool. Louis, that he did that. Yeah, yeah. You know, they had, they had, because, uh, you know, I'm sure at that point, I'm sure No Effects and Guttermouth had probably played two dozen shows together. You know what I mean? Like, there was yeah. definitely, yeah, there were no hard feelings. And, 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 and right away, Hope was like, these songs sound fucking great. Let me know when, uh, when we can get them mixed and let's figure out, you know, release schedules and all that. So, yeah, by that, that all went down end of 94 and into early 95 and then by fall of 95 the the first uh the first album came out so what was like um so did you god there's so many questions there did like when <laughs> so when you guys did the seven inch for fat and then yeah. you know i can anytime anytime anyone gets some kind of success either there's like a real push for oh my god that's awesome and then there's mm -hmm. fuck you I, i'm not successful now i'm gonna be bitter did you see a bit of a divide in like the scene at all? or like you're you're following it all or was there like a negative connotation to that some of the bands that we played our first couple of shows with were kind of bummed out because and, and probably rightfully so you know we weren't a band that you know, we didn't necessarily have all of our musical chops uh, together, and to see a see some you know new band like us get get that kind of success was probably you know probably bummed a few people out. And I know there was a few bands that we come up came up with um, that uh, were 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 a little irritated that we got as successful as we did. Yeah. Um, but as far as you know, the people that were going to see us play shows like uh fan wise there was it just got better and better like yeah you know. <laughs> i can imagine certainly cer certainly our family uh family members that weren't you know actively going to shows or listening to any of that music they were like oh you you're 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 on a rec record label out of california that must mean you guys know what you're doing <laughs> you've made it <laughs> yeah exactly hollywood here we come <laughs> <laughs> how, how soon did you guys go on like tour was it during 93 or did you guys wait till like 94 or 90 god we were just i was just talking about this with with one of the guys uh first tour that we did was with the bull weevils okay um and i want to say it was it was south it was south and southeast and i want to say it was i want to say it was 94 um summer and no it might have been it was either fall of 93 or like spring or summer of '94, um, and it was you know it was five six days at the most, and it was with it was with you know our best friends. So if there was any sort of drama going on in one van, you could always switch and go over to the other van where <laughs> <laughs> yeah those 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 dudes were getting along. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that was fun. That's and that's actually where uh, where we met Rancid. We we uh, we played a show with them in Augusta, Georgia, or South Carolina, or one of the two. Wow, this is like before they were like rancid, like where everyone knew that. This, right? th this, this is like, yeah, it's right, right before "Let's Go" uh, came out. Jesus Christ! Or right around the time it came out. Yeah. Did you find you were playing a lot of shows that were with bigger bands that you had heard of, and you were like, "Wow, we're we're getting to play with all these fucking bands that are." Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Our, uh, our our again like we 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 had a ton of luck on our on our side. Our our third. If I got this correct, I think our third show 
we played uh, just down the street from Wrigley Field with uh, Voodoo Glow Skulls. Wow. And, you know, definitely back then, I was like, holy shit, you know, A, Voodoo Glow Skulls, B, Doctor Strange. Yeah. You know, this is, this is fucking great. Um, and then, yeah, we got to play, well, I'll, 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 I'll say this, uh, bring it back to Propagandi. Uh, we were so stoked on those dudes. Uh, they came into town. I take that back. It was just Chris and Todd was still an I spy. Um, but they were doing like, I think they were just in town maybe to just to hang out or whatever. And, um, we met up with them and, and of course took them to Denny's and said, you know, when Propagani wants to do any sort of tour, let us know. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, let's do a show together. And, um, we didn't have any sort of connections to play, uh, any place of a larger scale at the time. So we played in our friend's basement. So it was Propagani's first time in Chicago. They played a, a basement in, in the Chicago suburbs. It was fucking awesome. Oh my God. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. Is this, is this um, before Less Talk, More Rock came out? Or Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, was like, uh, how to clean everything. Jesus. It was how, how to clean everything was already out. Didn't uh, pigs, the pigs will pay seven inch? Whatever seven inch they did right after um, right after how to clean everything. Okay. I can't think of the name of that seven inch. But they, were, they had that and the seven inch, I think, at the time. I heard something that right around the time Less Talk, More Rock came out or before it, mm-hmm. they they weren't really touring in the States because they were getting threatened by like the hammer skins or some shit like that. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any specific examples, but I, I, I totally believe it. They were very outspoken, (laughs) very outspoken. They, they, and good for them. You know, we, (laughs) yes, I could, my, my, me back then I could, I could, I could, I could speak really loudly, but I, I definitely was, uh, I didn't have, certainly didn't have the balls to say, half the stuff that I wanted to. And those guys, you know, that strong Canadian blood, uh, did not prevent them from saying what they wanted to say. Yeah. Like the nicest people in the world, the Canadians, and they were like really pissed. Yeah. Just so confusing yeah. to me. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> then the weaker thing yeah. comes out and I'm like, Oh yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago had such a thing. I mean, I'm not going to go this, but Chicago had such a thing for the weaker thens too, back then. They, oh, were, yeah. they were like gods, not gods, but I mean, that's kind of a strong thing, but they were really looked up to back then. What was, what was funny is I didn't, I didn't see it coming. I had, yeah, we had, we, we, we knew, we knew that John was out of propaganda and then I don't know if, I don't know that I even heard that he was in a new band until that first week of this record came out and then you played it and you're like, oh my God. See, like, I didn't like Fallow. Or f- fallow, right? That's a, that's the follow. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I, 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 I loved it, but I was so surprised because I was like, "Oh, this is not going to go over well with the uh, with the fat wreck crowd." At oh, all. yeah. <laughs> oh, but then Left and Leaving came out, and that first song, the 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 hit, uh, whatever that song is, that that my buddy played it for me. My buddy Anthony yeah. from Chicago, he played it for me when when I was out there, and I'm like, "This song is fucking incredible." Yeah, Isn't um, there, wasn't there one song? Wasn't there one propaganda song that he redid in the Weaker Thins? He did that and Fallow. Um, a Fallow, Anchor, Anchorless, right? Yeah, yeah, Anchorless, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, real good. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any like crazy stories from? I mean, there's you guys, you guys like because I'm looking. You have you put out behind bars. Actually, yeah. at this point, did you put out behind bars? Or are we are we there yet? Behind Bars had not come out, so, so okay. the propaganda show was '94. Uh, Behind Bars came out at the in the fall of '95. Okay, so Behind Bars comes yeah. out, and that's on Hopeless. Yeah. yeah, and that's the other way that I heard you guys because my my buddy would. Uh, yeah, so when that came out, I saw the CD at my buddy's house, and I was like, "Oh wow, that that band looks, you know, scary." <laughs> <laughs> um, but then uh, I've one came out um, on uh-huh. the. Uh, cinema beer goggles and that was yeah. that was a huge thing because hopeless is putting out cinema beer nuts and i think that one had uh had no, no effects on it. it had lag wagon mm-hmm. it was like this mix of fat and hopeless bands and some other bands too like some labels that were not like as byo yeah. Yeah. yeah there was like tilt wheel was on this i think the same one yep. that you guys were on and yep. um so that came out, and that out of that entire just that entire um, or videography or whatever that would be called, I don't know that video, yeah. uh, video compilation. Yeah. Um, I've one was like one of my favorite songs on, oh, on awesome. that because it was so like 
it starts off like okay you know it's just kind of normal and then like your voice kicked in i was like i like this guy's voice it's like super like <laughs> rough and it's like oh nice you know and then all of a sudden then like the stop like i've like i've won like just that, yeah. that pause and then you guys are crammed in this like room like just hitting <laughs> into each other like what was the film yeah. process for that and like were you guys oh. stoked that you got to do it well that 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 is a uh that is that is that's a story and oh. I'll, I'll say i'll, I'll start it out with we were uh out west um we had done done one last west coast tour before the album came out and we got to beat the guys in hopeless and one of the things they wanted to do was hey we want to film a video for one of your songs and i don't even know that yeah i'm sure we had picked out we had picked out i've won by that point and um as a song to do and then we so lewis uh and then brought lewis brought two guys with him one of them was the videographer, you know, videographer. And, yep. uh, for some reason we didn't do anything in California, but they, uh, they came out to Vegas when we played and they said, all right, we're going to, uh, we'll do some live footage, but then we also want to do, um, some goofy footage of maybe you guys on, and I can't think of the name of the casino. It's one of those casinos out there that has the, uh, roller coaster indoors. Okay. I can't think of the name of the casino. I, I think, I don't even know if it's still around, but, at any rate, and I hate roller coasters. I fucking hate them. <laughs> I I puke like a like like a fucking like the Exorcist. Like it's it's insane. <laughs> and uh, so I hated it. But I was like, all right, we got we got to do it. I'm not going to be the one guy that says, oh, I'm scared. I can't do it. So we're all waiting in line. And I don't know why this guy, even with his camcorder, I don't know why he thought he was going to be able to bring a fucking camera on that roller coaster. But you know, people behind the casino or the or the um, uh, the the roller coaster rider, like, sir, you can't bring that camera. Uh, on the roller coaster and so i immediately like exhale like oh thank god <laughs> this isn't gonna happen and they're like all right well um we, we don't really have a plan b at the moment um we'll figure it out when you guys get home but we got to do something really really quick we're like all right cool so and i don't know that vegas might have been one of the last shows of the tour um if not the last show and so we immediately started driving home uh side note my then wife was pregnant with my son. Okay. And we get to almost home when I start hearing from her that she's, <laughs> she's starting to have, you know, some really strong contractions. I'm like, uh, put the fucking pedal to the metal. I need to get my ass home. Jesus. Uh, and this is still like weeks before he, you know, weeks premature. Like, like, you know, he's this, this baby's not, it should not be coming out, but may very well be coming out. And, uh, we get home. Um, I remember thinking, okay, uh, or I remember going to the hospital, being told, no, we're we're gonna delay the delivery as long as we can. So that was like the the the, the day I got home from that tour, or the next day, came home, and then um, <laughs> the record label, uh, Hope is 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 contacting us, saying, okay, guys, we we want to get out there in the next like week. What what can we do? And I'm 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 in like dad prep mode. Like, this is one of the first times I was like, I'm not thinking about the band. I just got off tour, like, for the first time that I, I can think of, I don't want to think about the band. I just want to think about what the hell I'm going to do. And uh, the guys are calling me like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I, I'm i sure at one point I probably lost my patience. I was like, you guys figured out what the fuck you're going to do. Right now, I'm, I'm going to figure out what being a dad's like. And... Uh, they ended up filming. So there's that part of the video where they're uh, walking inside of a photo booth. Yeah, that was done. I was not involved in that at all. That was in a in a a, a far suburban uh, mall. Um, they did that, but the uh, the part where we're all scrunched in together, that was filmed in the kitchen of my apartment because I could not leave my. <laughs> She was going to give birth any, like literally any second. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not leaving. You guys want to come to me. And I didn't think they were going to do it, but they're like, Nope, the hopeless guys are already here. If we've got to come to you, we got to come to you. So through, through, through patience and God knows what else we decided at, you know, 1 AM, we were going <laughs> to film this part of the video in my kitchen. Oh my um, God. So yeah, that's just a, that's just a camera or I'm uh, sorry, just a curtain in the back. And, uh, <laughs> 
guys have their bass, the guitar, and you know, Glenn had his snare and his in his sticks, and we just did like ten takes of that part, you know, lip syncing or whatever, and that was yeah, that was the video. It's so fucking brilliant, and, and I remember yeah. it vividly to this day. Even though I can't find the fucking thing on YouTube, <laughs> I uh, that's the thing that stood out to me. I love how last minute shit like that, when you just kind of tape things together, become like the coolest shit. Yeah, like I mean, for me, I mean, for you, when you were oh, yeah. like, yeah, it was whatever. But like, I, I, I was like, that's like that was so much. There was so much going on in that video. It was just that part of it because I loved. The one thing I love about punk music and that scene is that a lot of, it was bands just didn't fucking take themselves seriously. Right. And oh, totally, totally. I love that aspect because it was just you could just be fucking free and not have to, you know, and that's why I didn't like the scene where it turned into later on, because then it became airtight and you had to wear the right clothes and fucking yeah. eyeliner and all this bullshit. And uh, yeah. I was so loose in the, like the '90s, which I mm-hmm. loved that so much. Like our Jinko jeans, like really loose. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but like when that came out, like did you know that they were gonna put out that compilation, or they just say, hey, we just need a video, we're gonna figure it out, or do they have it planned where they knew that was gonna happen and it was gonna they, compile they, it? They had it planned, and we knew we we knew at least who the other heavy hitters were. We we're like, oh, oh, we're gonna be on there with no use for a name and. Uh, yeah, I think I think I think uh, there was a no effects song on Ten there too. Ten foot poles on there. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's see, yeah, Blink's Eminem, Eminem's on there. Yeah, no yeah. effects, the Goops. No, yeah, man. I mean, that was such a fucking solid compilation. Actually, it was really funny because years later, uh, in two thousand one, in two thousand three, like I was in San Diego for a couple months, and mm-hmm. I actually uh, met Davey Tiltwheel. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, he uh, he was. They were still playing, so like, I ended up making up another band out there, and we ended up playing a show with them. And I was like, "Are you mm-hmm. the guy who threw up in the video <laughs> in a dumpster?" That's awesome. He's like, "Yeah, that's me." He was like, still that's living hilarious. the fucking dream. Um, <laughs> holy shit, that's amazing. So okay, so you guys are so. Um, actually, I hate doing time too because it's like it's an hour, and I know you got to get to the thing. I got I got a maybe a couple more minutes. Okay, fuck. There's so many more questions. Sorry, man. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's totally fine. Um, all right, so you guys are torn. Uh, you're on Hopeless. You guys put out uh, 80 Fingers Up Your Ass, and then you guys break up. That apparently wasn't due to a fight with you and Glenn. Um, well, t- t- just to correct you real quick, 80 Fingers Up Your Ass didn't come out until after we broke up. That, uh, oh. 88, 88 Fingers Up Your Ass is all the um, all of our vinyl collected on one oh, record. Oh, okay. Oh. And that, they, they came out... Uh, that came out in ninety, either ninety six or ninety seven. We'd already broke up in, in, in between hopeless albums. Okay, all yeah. right. So like, but like, what? So the you guys, you know, if it's you know, I like to keep this like super chill, so like not yeah. cause drama, shit. Like, but like, you guys obviously no. broke up for some reason. If you want to talk about it, um, we, we broke up because I I I uh, I could not balance uh, family life and, and music okay. at that point. The kid, the, my son was born in the uh, in the fall of '95, just actually right before the record came out, before Behind Bars came out, and um, by '90, by summer '96, um, I just was I was felt I felt pressure on both sides, both on the band side and the family side, and I was I had a bit of a nervous breakdown and and said, "All right, actually." <laughs> It was a combination of me getting ready to tell those guys, I don't think I could do this anymore. And then they finally said, we can't work. <laughs> we can't do this with you anymore. So we called time on the band in, in 96. And then uh, for about a year and a half, we didn't really see each other or talk to each other. And then things picked back up in the start of 98. Were you guys actually got, making, were you guys making money on the, from like torn and stuff and the records like during that time? Um, yeah, I mean enough enough to probably buy us, you know, a, a, a couch here, a chair there, but <laughs> nothing, not, nothing crazy. But it was definitely, um, you know, nice chunk of change when none of us, I don't think, had any um, full time jobs to speak of when we got home. It was a nice, you know, nice bit of padding. Yeah, it wasn't something though that was going to keep you in the game for like the decision of leaving or not. You're like, well, oh no, yeah, no, 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 no. I could I could go home and work for seven dollars an hour and make more money. <laughs> Oh, so when you guys like so you guys break up and then I heard uh, I heard your interview on lead singer syndrome and yeah. 
I heard that because um, when you guys recorded the new record, you did it mm-hmm. in your first or um, in John's basement. No, Dan. Or, Dan. Oh, so oh, it was Dan's. Yeah. Car, Dan's studio. Yeah. Dan's got a uh, studio in his uh, in, in his basement. Yeah. Okay, so you guys did not. <clears throat> wasn't there an option for you guys to actually potentially record there for Back on the Streets? Uh, back on the streets. No, but he hadn't had this. He didn't really start, um, any sort of engineering until, uh, until we recorded back on the streets. He was kind of, um, kind of like the second engineer, uh, to, to, to master Eugenie, the guy that, that did everything for us at that, at, at, on back on the streets. So Dan didn't really get his, uh, uh, the feel for producing until, until we worked on that at Sonic Iguana. Oh, okay. Yeah. How did you guys like the the tour that you guys did for like when you guys when you when you got did back in the streets did you guys go back out for like a while or did you just kind of cut it short? No, that 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 was when back in the streets came out. When we got back together, I had split up with my son's mom and and uh, I said, all right, if 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 we're gonna make a go of this, this is somewhat of a full time band. Let's let's do it now. And uh, so we we for the better part of almost the entire yeah pretty much the entire year in 98 we were probably home a week here a week there but for the most part we were on the road and then <laughs> and then by uh by uh spring early summer 99 i was kind of kind of going back in the same mode like all right can we at least take a couple of months off before we you know start the new album cycle and the guys were not feeling it they're like no we got to keep striking while the iron's hot and so we we split up again in in uh, uh, summer '99. Yeah. And so did you guys? Did you feel like you kind of got out of it at the right time after, like, before the transition of everything? Um. Yes and no, because I I immediately uh, came home and started another band because I didn't necessarily want to stop doing music. I just didn't want to go on tour. And uh, but but those guys, I mean, the songs. Uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn by saying this, but a couple of the songs that we had started writing or they, they had started writing that was going to be a new 88 record ended up being on the first rise against record. So, you know, I, oh, wow. <laughs> I may have, there may have been an error in judgment on my part, but like I, like I said, on Shane's podcast, I'm, you know, uh, Tim did better work on, on those songs, I think than, than I could ever could have. So, but it, it, it was just funny because they're like, well, we fucking love these songs. I'm like, all right, do, do what you want. I'm tired of playing, Try to sound like bad religion or whatever the hell I said back then. <laughs> and then, you know, then, you know, a year later, that first Rise Against record comes out. And I'm like, ooh, I have, again, I have made a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Fucking Brian Fallon, who's in Gaslight Anthem, was in Lane Meyer for like a hot minute at the end. So. Oh, no shit. <laughs> yeah. Not like we were ever going to go in the same direction as him, but it's so funny seeing him go off and he becomes Gaslight Anthem. like, that's fucking dope, but I was right? like, yeah. I was like, I was never gonna go. I was like, I was never gonna be a part of that. So there's no like, yeah. well, I fucked up. It's like, no, it just yeah. it just did not work out. It's like, God bless you well, for still doing it. Well, it's like when we when, when the band first split up in '96, we're on that long drive home, and I'm in the back with uh with Glenn, and he hands me a demo of this uh <laughs> this new band he had started with his best friend Matt called Alkaline Trio, and I'm yeah. like. He's like, yeah, Matt's gonna get behind the drum kit or get in front of the drum kit and sing and play guitar. And I, of course, immediately was like, does Matt think he's Dave Grohl? Like, <laughs> this shit's catchy. Don't get me wrong, but oh man, okay. And then you know, Here and then are. you know, Alkaline Trio came and went. I wonder what happened. Yeah, what that band? I think yeah. they had. I think they had a demo poor, tape. That was about it. Poor guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I would have asked you a lot more, probably a lot more questions, but I do want to be respectful of your time and not have cool. your girlfriend fucking kill you. Um, <laughs> I do want to tell anyone out there though. Um, so they, these guys did put out a record in 2017 called thank you for being a friend and it's fucking good. And I just have to say that meds has been on heavy rotation in my Spotify list since I oh. heard the, the interview with you and Shane, like I think six months ago, maybe like, yeah, it, I, right. I hear that song. I've heard that song every single day because it's, I always have shuffle on my list every, not even kidding. Every single day, probably for like, since like fucking August or September. Like, Oh, that's awesome. It's so good. Like, what is that song about? I mean, it seems like I kind of know, but like, I wanted you to tell me. <laughs> oh, it's, 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 uh, uh, substance abuse. It's, it's, you know, friend, friends over the years, uh, you know, not not anybody particular, but friends over the years have just kind of 
what started out as a small little habit of, you know, I'm going to pop a Viking in here and there, just kind of turn into a full blown, you know, opioid addiction and just kind of what goes through their head when they're, when they think they're, they think they're never going to do it again. And then they're, whether it's something that they're being prescribed or otherwise, it just, that shit gets kind of out of hand. And unfortunately too many of our friends back home here are, are still victim to that. That's fucking shitty. Um, well, I'll show it to end on a, a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, well, um, well, I appreciate you being on. So I usually end with two questions or yeah, two things. Uh, one, before I ask my last question, um, what would you like to plug? Uh, what would I like to plug? Um, we have a, uh, a two song seven inch that came out, uh, a couple of, well, maybe a year ago now called, uh, get off my lawn. It's, uh, on our friends band, our friends label underground communique. And it's, uh, two covers. Uh, we covered uh, red hop by Motley Crue and long, long way from home by foreigner. And, uh, it was fun as shit to do. We did super quick in dance studio and um we've got some some vinyl that we're uh we're bringing with us when we play out and it's available at underground communique.bandcamp.com okay all right and last question um yeah. i ask this to everybody what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day um what, what whatever we do musically and whatever i choose to do musically or creatively I do it for myself before I do it for anybody else. I got to make myself, we got to make ourselves happy before we make anybody else happy. 